Trigger on! Welcome, d roll to the Dog Face Diaries. We are a World Trigger read-through podcast aiming to discuss the World Trigger manga volume by volume. I'm Wensley Dale Cheddar. And I'm Hoven with an H. And this month we're covering Volume 8, which contains chapters 62 to 70, and that's episodes 28 to 31 of the anime if you're watching along. How are you doing? Ah, BT to it. <laughs> you did. Uh, I am doing okay. Uh, I'm pretty busy with my new job, but I also have a bit of a cold, uh, which is like, this is like the worst time. I'm just like, I'm just chucking honey and lemons down, just like, go away, go away, there's a virulent strain of coronavirus about, go away, go away, I don't need you right now. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Being safe where I can, <laughs> but, but, yeah, <laughs> little, like, little anxious on that front. Uh, how have you been doing? Well, not really content with the reality, um, it, you know, it's me. Uh, relatively at peace that uh, at least we've managed to convince our families to not have a Christmas Eve dinner. That is good! That's good, maybe we're gonna survive for a week yeah. longer or something. So th- there's an important piece of news that, that <laughs> we probably should discuss. Uh, so uh, we've been hearing that the World Trigger anime is coming back and uh, uh, that season two is going to have... Mm, indeed. So we haven't mentioned it on the show, but unlike the first season, uh, which uh, was going to have 70 plus episodes, th- this one will be only a one short core w- with a 12 episode run and will premiere in Japan on uh, January the 9th. It's also been announced that there's already a third season in production, uh, which is quite a rare thing in the anime industry. Um, the only other example I can think of off the top of my head is The Rising of a Shield Hero, which had a bunch of Crunchyroll money behind it. Hmm. But yeah, I think I'd reckon it. the likelihood is that in this case, it's probably just like, we already wanted to adapt this stretch of episodes, but we want to split it up to make it easier to schedule. It's probably a logistics issue, uh, although I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if it's like the strength of the loyalty of the audience as well, uh, given what we know of the World Trigger fandom. Indeed. We will discuss more more of that in Spoiler Corner uh, on our thoughts on uh, what the anime is going to adapt, but for now, today's agenda will be a quick recap of Volume 8. Created, as usual, by Daisuke Ashihara, translated by Lillian Elson. Uh, Touching up and lettering was done by Ace Grisman, designed by Sam Ellsway. The Shonen Jump editor for World Trigger was Hope Donovan, and the volume editor was Marlene First. So, next on we will uh, move on to our general thoughts, next to Ashihara Comments Corner, Spoiler Corner, and, uh, as usual, our Q&A segment. So, yeah, ready to begin? No, just kidding. (laughs) Ready? Let's get to the summary. We get a brief recap of where everyone is on the map with a pretty cool visual uh, before cutting to Enadora the Explorer, who asks the readers, (laughs) Do you see the brainless rats? Do you see them squirm? (laughs) Pyrain points out that he never ordered an attack on the base, but Enadora ignores him, claiming that his method is too slow and not at all educational for the readers at home. (laughs) Abandoning the mission, defying orders. Should I force him back? Moira inquires, but Hyrone decides against it, continuing with usual plans, knowing that he now has a valid excuse to recall the insubordinate team member. Reiji's fight with Hughes continues, and he makes good use of a building's cover and traps to catch him off guard. But Visa comes in, and to shield Hughes from one of the mines set off by the tripwires. He recognises Reiji's ploy to stall them, and opts to finish Reiji off quickly with, with a staff, Assumably powered by Afto's equivalent of QAnon, Organon. <laughs> no, no, wait, 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 wait. We're mixing our, we're mixing our metaphors here. Isn't the Conservator Squad supposed to be QAnon? I mean, maybe these are the Conservator Squad of their own world. They are going out and invading others, after all. That's true, that's true. The, uh, they are colonizers, to be fair. You need to, you need to have perspective here. Um, <laughs> so this weapon seems to send out invisible slashes that demolish the evacuated buildings in the alleyway around them in an impressive two-page spread. As Reiji evades it- I'm sorry, who? Shit, I've been doing it wrong. As Composed Beefcake evades it, Replica comments that according to Hugo's records, this black trigger is one of Afto's national treasures, and wonders what could possibly be going on out there for them to send, in order for them to send it. Visa and Hughes use a double fake-out to allow Visa to get past Composed Beefcake's shield, slicing his Treon body in half across his waist. 
The post beefcake briefly flashes back to a conversation with Jin, where he's advised to draw his fight out as much as possible. Following this, he uses his thruster to launch his blade trigger into Visa's leg just before he bails out, dealing a significant wound. Back at base, Rip Composed Beefcake is greeted by a disappointed, headstrong Yotaro and takes on the duty of analysing the data on Visa that Shiori recorded, um, so that she can continue supporting the others. With the passage to the base locked down, the C rank escorting crew are unable to get in. Before they have much time to decide on the plan of action, however, Visa and Hughes glide over, Hughes having used his magnetic trigger to form a launch rail and gliding rings. Just then, Jin arrives with a crash into the building to take them on, and is shortly joined by Yuma as he arrives with a ham. <laughs> if you uh, if you if you read it on mobile, it, 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 it looks like it says ham. I fucking love this panel. The W is just a bit off, so it's not a single bit of it is on the on the first page. <laughs> so it just says ham. I I, I love it. it. It's it's Ace's best work. <laughs> Hughes tries to get a surprise shot in on Chika, but good boy Osamu blocks it with his arm. Jin tells them to go directly to the base before Viz is able to stop them. Yuma seals him with some chain triggers he set up from prior. With Jim walling them off from the escaping trainees with his scudo, the two of them split into one-on-one fights. Jin with Hughes and Yuma with Visa. Though Hughes notes his ace in the hole to his senior of the magnetic shot still stuck onto Osamu's arm. After overwhelming Visa with his anchor triggers, Yuma asks why they're attacking Earth as opposed to other, closer worlds. Visa claims that their aim is to send people to all neighbouring nations, but doesn't answer any follow-up questions before the fight resumes. Jin lures Hughes into an underground passage, and when seemingly subdued by the neighbour's magnet, reveals a surprise future his trigger has told him. Hughes will be abandoned on Earth. Learning this has Hughes drop his guard for just long enough for Jin to restrain him between two massive escudo walls. Meanwhile, HQ is in a panic about the base exploring Enidora. He's interrupted in his hunting down of the agents by a familiar decubed individual. Huh? He says, Suwa, no shooting! <laughs> Kazuma assures the newly revived Suwa that Enidora must have a weak point somewhere due due to his Treon body, even if it's hard to find. In a clever ploy, the squad lures the intrepid explorer into the training room, where their Treon bodies can be instantly regenerated, giving them several attempts to try and find the neighbor's supply and relay section as he's locked in. Seeing this, Shinoda starts to make his way over, passing his duties of commander on to Kido temporarily. The Golden Goose is heading towards the Maiden base. The situation has shifted to the third loin. Moira informs High Rain as she brings him up to speed on the goings-on. We learn that Hughes' magnet on Osamu is a tracking device, and High Rain plans to send in rabbits as soon as they get enough distance from the fights with Visa and Hughes. Visa and Yuma continue their battle, Visa cutting his way through whatever projectiles or traps Yuma launches his way, and eventually nicking one of his hands off. Via his side effect, Yuma realises that Visa is actually stalling him and sends in Replica's main body to help the C-rank guarding parties. As he does this, High Raid's play is already set in motion, the remaining rabbits descending on Osamu and company. We cut to Team Scruffy Hottie escaping the seven rabbits as he tries to block the way uh, of pursuit via Escudo walls. Uh, the A-rank idiot trio come to the raid, uh, Midorikawa and Yonea engaging the new models in close combat, while Izumi, whom Osamu notices to be the A-rank number one shooter, provides ranged support. As Osama leads the C-Rank's escape, uh, however, the rabbit with Husei's Lampiris ability slips through. Isaho tries to save it off, but neither her nor Osamu's attacks are strong enough to pierce its armour. However, Chika holds Osama's hand to establish a temporary trigger link with him. It's actually quite clever of her, she must have noticed it earlier as a possibility when she grabbed Isho's rifle earlier. It's, um, I, I just noticed it now, but it's quite clever. She said that uh, he'll find the best use for her power. Recalling Kitora's and Scruffy Hottie's advice about the main advantages of shooters over attackers, being the ability to coordinate a mass attack with other agents, Osama fires a giant asteroid at the rabbit engaged with Izumi. Noticing the sheer volume of the bullet, of pure bullet, <laughs> High Rain orders Moira to open a portal for, for him, uh, planning on capturing the Golden Goose himself. 
I was Osama and Chica coordinate with Izumi to shoot down another rabbit, uh, after which Osama explains the situation. Impressed by their ability, Izumi invites them to shoot the whole lot of the, the rabbits together, but a moment later, Chica freezes, saying, Birds! Birds? Well, yes, Chica, I know you're, you're an avid ornithologist, but we've got to get a move on and evacuate! <laughs> Uh, but no, it's Hyrain, who uses his Elector trigger uh, to send down a rain of animated bird-shaped bullets uh, to cubify the sea ranks with a single touch. Yuneya enemy Dorikawa notices it works on weapons as well, anything try and base really, uh, forcing the latter to bail out and paralysing Izumi's legs. When ordered to run, Osama attempts one more trick, flanking Hyrain with Chika and then shooting him while he's distracted. This simple strategy doesn't work well against uh, an experienced commander like Hyrain, however, as noticing the Lamborus location chip on Osamu, he shoots right back, avoiding Four Eyes and his slow buckshot shield, cubifying only Chika. Osamu freezes, blaming himself for thinking he was stronger just because he used Chika's power. Scruffy Hotty snaps him out of it and he soon runs off again with Chika's cube in hand, using Thruster to increase his mobility and Izumi's cover fire to escape in a fantastically drawn action scene. Uh, Osamu crashes uh, among the rubble, at the mercy of a magnetic rabbit, before Replica steps in to shield them, opening a gate and summoning a rabbit with a border emblem on it. Holy shit! Osamu and Replica use the opening given to them by the Replica rabbit, shout out, to run ahead. Uh, Four Eyes is quite worried about Yuma being alone, but Replica says uh, them coming here is something uh, Yuma decided himself. Replica explains the future crossroads depend on if Osama and Chika get to the base, so the plan is to break in while Enidora the Explorer is locked away battling in training mode. So we cut away to the training room. Enidora is starting to understand how it nullifies its Trine damage, while Sua manages to locate the Trine supply shell. Uh, however, just as Daichi marks it for them, uh, Enidora reveals he can create dummy shells and uh, shift them around his gaseous body. Yes, gaseous, not liquid. Uh, gaseous is, uh, is is it how you pronounce it? I, I haven't actually checked. Um, I say I say gaseous. Gaseous, yes, uh, gaseous body, not liquid, as Kazama and Mikami discover. Enidora touches the button that switches the training mode off as he expands. I love it that, that he does it by accident. He doesn't do it. Uh, he doesn't even notice it. But at this point, they've done the research. It's also then at this point that Shinoda joins the battle. I kid you not, running across the inner wall of HQ and slashing it open to jump into the training room directly. Parkour! <laughs> when Shinoda thinks they'll have to lock him here um, since they can't let him escape. Uh, Enidora says, You think this is enough to beat me? Your trigger is insignificante. Naturally, uh, Shinoda responds. We've been sharpening our fangs all these years just to defeat someone like you. And then a black screen says, About 960 seconds until the future crossroads. So apparently volume 9 takes place in the span of 16 minutes. Good to know. Alright, uh, shall we get to general thoughts? Let's do it. Okay, so this was quite a tense volume. Uh, I call myself sometimes flipping the pages without uh, taking notes and uh, then going back to read the chapters all over again. Uh, overall, I, I thought it was a volume full of important character moments, uh, primarily for Osama and Yuma, the former dealing with the fallout of his overconfidence and still jumping to fulfil an important role of getting Chika back to the base despite his failure. The latter, meanwhile, truly faces risk for the first time in the face of a more experienced opponent. He's also trying to gather info about Aftal's motivations, since now he's got something to protect. Uh, when he realises Visa is lying about Yuma stalling him uh, being a problem, he decides to risk even more by splitting with Replica and sending them to aid Osamu, sacrificing his safety. So the theme of sacrifice will become clearly intertwined with the theme of fate next volume, although for now it's uh, difficult to discuss the, that relationship in its entirety, since we can see both of those themes represented across the volume in like little bits and pieces though. There's Osama's speech saying that um, you know, Osama and Chika were able to 
like survive until this point uh, thanks to all those a ranks coming to the raid kitora idiot trio and stuff then we have the foreshadowing of yusei being left sacrificed by high rain to die on on Meden. Uh, then Chika giving her power for Osama to use and uh, to decide her fate. Kind of a bit, you can see, in um, Kazama being a sacrifice to uh, to later analyze an Adora. So, you know, I've been keeping a tally of, of how long this streak of volumes ending on a good cliffhanger is. And honestly, I feel like this one, it could have ended on almost any chapter in the second half and it would have worked. <laughs> uh, it would have applied. Hmm. It really is, like you said, ramping up the tension. One of the elements of that that I really like is having it so that you go from that extreme high of Osamu and Chika getting this ace in the hole, working out to use her Treon for his attack and, and actually doing stuff, then just one chapter before Chika gets cubed. Uh, it's a very nice high-to-low swing to keep things tense. Mm, yeah. I liked um, Enidora the Explorer's fight too. Um, it, 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 it is always like a nice underdog feature using uh, everyday HQ features to gain an advantage uh, to yeah. research the opponent. Um, I'm, um, I really like the um, the use of the mundane made awesome trope, um, especially with Sewer Squad involved since uh, they were earlier seen in operating the training room. Yeah, it's like Ashihara has already found two really interesting uses for a training room in a, for like training room mechanics, <laughs> which is not something I'd expect from a series. It also turns out that maybe Enidora was the monkey that they were studying all along. I mean, doesn't Dora the Explorer have a monkey? Does he have a monkey? Or like Boots. Yeah, she's got a monkey called Boots or something. <laughs> oh, okay. I just got the <laughs> <laughs> the reference to the actual Dora. <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, no, um, it's just like his whole thing. Because he, he doesn't, he doesn't just call them monkeys. He just he refers to them as all kinds of animals. He's just emphasizing how just uppity he is, and just he, he thinks of all people from other worlds as uh, animals. That's an interesting thing about. But I guess both him and um, High Rain emphasize in that, like, yeah, these other worlds, they are, they do just have very similar. They seem to have very similar wildlife to Earth, right down to the neighbors being more humanoid, and they have, you know, ma the same kind of mammals. High Rain has his um, Treon, his Treon weapons in the form of different animals. I guess it's just emphasizing that they're not really going for like alien-looking designs, and that the Treon soldiers themselves were sort of a misdirect there. I really haven't considered it, but uh, yeah, I, I suppose um, I suppose the the ecosystems to to those worlds, to those planets, must be quite similar. Uh, I really like how <laughs> Sewer Squad's big play with Enadora hinges on his inability to comprehend how Earth doors work. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I really love Enadora for for that reason. I. I didn't remember him being so daft. <laughs> I love his dumbfounded expressions uh, combined with his superiority complex. It, it, he makes for a really, <laughs> really fun antagonist in that. I, I don't know why I expected like this fight to be uh, to be resolved here. I um, I kind of jumbled the events around in uh, in my mind uh, since I I thought that uh, this whole fight resolved uh, earlier than. Uh, Chica turning into a cube. I think my initial my initial uh, recollection of this arc was that it was mostly the first volume with the Treon soldier stuff, and that like everything else was kind of bunched into the latter half. Mm. Uh, when it's not much like that, uh, I like so that having the battle be fought on the front of the goal that Osamu's crew are making their way towards is a very effective in that it makes the safety of Osamu and Chica's destination really uncertain, which is an interesting touch. Um, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it factors more into how every single part of this battle is crucial in its own way. It's also interesting that, just like with Lars' volume, you mentioned the differences and similarities between the worlds. Just like Lars' volume, it's interesting mm -hmm. how... Uh, Visa thinks that Yuma's Black Trigger is is Meden based. It, it it would be kind of natural for him to assume it is, mm. since uh, he doesn't know Yuma was born on another world, and he only notices yeah. it later when he notices La Replica. Yeah, there's a lot that Visa doesn't seem to know, which is interesting. He doesn't know that Border Triggers can switch between weapons, and he says, "Oh, there's more to that shield that beats the eye." When he sees a composed Beefcake launching his uh his trigger at him. After after after, 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 after triggers, I legitimately stammered when I pronounced it this time. 
<laughs> it, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> yeah, so Aptos triggers do generally seems to be like uh, one trigger, a few functions, but uh, generally an extension of the trigger's primary property. Yeah, I think I think for me it's more just the case of like Visa is a very experienced soldier, and they, mm, I guess they've not sent humanoid neighbors on away missions to Meden before. Uh, speaking of triggers, um, Jin is using double scorpions now, as he did before earlier on. The manga mentioned, uh, I think Usami mentioned that it was developed on like hmm. his request, and uh, he's coming back to to his old weapon now uh, that he doesn't have Fujin. There was kind of a triple threat of, of really cool moments at the end of this volume, which were my favourite, which was Osamu launching his trigger at the rabbit. Like, that was so cool. <laughs> what, what a trooper. Then, Shin obviously, Shinoda's parkour and um, replica rabbit having a, a Godzilla fight with another replica. <laughs> it, even, it, like, even does, like, the atomic breath, but with um, humor's bolt. Like, we had two moments of Ray Gust launching in this volume uh, with, I like that Composer Beefcake had an interesting mm. special modification to his Ray Gust, allowing him to, like, um, combine it with Thruster as a thrown dagger, so it, it worked a little differently than an ordinary Ray Gust. Uh, I also liked his mm. Big Brother moment that he had with uh, with Jin in his talk with him. Yeah. Uh, don't point with your chopsticks. S uh, stop it. Stop it now. It's rude. Also, yeah, also just then generally this being a big crunch moment for Osamu, where it's like, it's the first time he's ever been under this sort of pressure before, and he's he's so out of his depth here. Seeing him crushed uh, uh, right after, like, gaining some confidence for once. A uh, really relatable moment for uh, for a lot of readers, I think. I do have some standout panels. So, so first of all, uh, Visa using Organon for the first time, cutting apart buildings around him. Uh, Ashihara praised his assistance for it, uh, in particular, on his character page. Also, Visa slashing uh, Reiji behind his shield, and also Visa being kicked to the the ground in the ham panel by Yuma. It's, everything is Visa related in this volume. I, uh, I I guess he's made quite an impression on me. Mine was quite low key, but it was quite effective. It's the panel of Chica detecting high rain. It's just like a very black cloud mm. surrounding her. That effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was quite effective. Yeah. There's an interesting translation choice uh, that I that didn't particularly sit well with me. So, in general, in this volume, like, there's a lot of internal monologue from Replica of all people. Mm -hmm. Or, of all people. Of all characters. It's it's really interesting that, that like, a Trine soldier is getting so much internal monologue. I didn't particularly like the, the translation choice of what's mm -hmm. going on in uh, Aftokrator. It really it just doesn't sit well with me that Replica's using contractions. Yeah, I feel like something like, I wonder what could be going on in Afro Tokotor would be more his sort of wording. Yeah, contractions don't fit well in, in the mouth, really. The cubification feature on the rabbits. I have a bit of a theory that, like, all the rabbits have abilities of the Afro Tokotor soldiers that were sent on Earth. And we kind of think mm. of their ability to cubify as the basic ability. High Rain's trigger has this ability, so I think that might just not be a basic feature of them, but uh, all of them having just a feature copied from Elector, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can see that. I guess it'll be interesting to see if, um, if Ashihara ever goes into like the actual development of the Trion Soldiers. Like Maybe they show us the Trion Soldiers factory, or... He he might well have gone into that in his in his uh his comments corner. So you never know. Uh, I did like Osama noting that uh like last volume he could only score a hit because the rabbits uh, were ignoring him at the time and uh, were focusing on Chica. That's why that happened, and uh, he didn't get that moment on his own. And this kind of tied into like him and Chica working together with Izumi. I love to imagine that when Osamu says. Oh, we're out of the emergence area. The, the tone that Jin says, but it's an emergence. E like it's just a really bad four kids dub read or something like that. Putting the emphasis on the pun. <laughs> One thing: Did Yuma set up his chain traps when he kicked Visa or beforehand? Yeah, the, yeah. The, this moment was was a bit hard to, to read. I think. Also, another moment that was hard for me to read was, was like it's like Hyrene said that that now he has a reason to 
call back an Adora, but he was already kind of calling him back. I, um, I didn't understand what he meant by that. The split screen recap of everyone in chapter 69. Nice. Of the bigotry, lol, XD, uh, is, is interesting. Perhaps Ashihara was like starting to realize how dense and intimidating the arc might have been week to week. Not really a spoiler, but it's not really a trend in the next arc. Going forward, he generally like does just go with, okay, my fans pay attention to this, the, <laughs> the readers pay attention to this stuff. Uh, I can I can just do really dense arts. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. All right then. So let's get to Ashihara Comments Corner. Okay, so uh, Chica is 30% cuter than usual. Uh, I'm not sure I'd agree, pal. I think she's at the usual high cuteness capacity in the spread to celebrate the anime. Oh yeah, right. Uh, I haven't actually seen that in color. Uh, it's it would be quite a treat to, uh, yeah, to do that. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. You can find it quite easily on the wiki. I think. So uh, should we go through the first popularity poll contest results? It being this 15 makes total sense. There's a few minor things with the order where I'm not. Like, I'm like, oh okay, like um. Arashiyama being above, like, Yonea, Tachikawa, and and composed beefcake is a bit... So I was like, huh? Oh, really? <laughs> I kind of expected K Kikuchihara to make it to to the top 15, but, but he didn't. I did wonder why, why they just featured Satori uh, with the note, a average face. <laughs> My Atsuji nice. was very much a surprise. Yeah, okay, no, she is actually the one where I'm like, yeah, that's a surprise. Uh, I don't I don't even remember who she, who she is. I do remember because, like, when we did World Trigger Bridge, we dubbed over all the gates keep appearing, all c citizens go to safety. Uh, yeah, we're um, it was all Ayatsuji, so uh, I am quite surprised. Shame on you people for not not voting for Shiori. Mm, yeah, exactly. Terrible. She has my vote. Um, but, you know, it, they voted Osamu number one, so I think that makes up for it. <laughs> Arashiyama, people who voted for him get it. He he's great. Uh, no, I like I like the seven the the ninth to seventh where it's like Izumi genius for the win. Scruffy Hottie. Hottie for the win. <laughs> Miwa. Sister Complex for the win. <laughs> Again with the fucking Sister Complex. <laughs> oh. Then we had Chika at number six. Jinuichi at, at number five. Uh, Kazama at number four. As as well as Konami at number three. And uh, Konami's uh, pretty much stayed at that position uh, for uh, for the entirety of the popularity polls i think yeah she's always i think them she's always one of the more popular girls definitely um i i, I get that with uh, i get that with her character and design she is very fun and then yeah then we have yuma and rope uh and I, I like i like uh ashihara's statement i think it's very it's very true uh the fact that the weak character who gives it is all got first place goes to show what kind of manga world trigger is i, I don't think i could have put it better <laughs> Yeah, well done, J Japanese fans, for appreciating our good boy. Uh, moving on to other uh, other comments. Uh, so uh, originally, when Ashihara created Visa, he didn't know w whether he would fight Jin or Yuma, which I thought it was interesting. Uh, he also like likes pets, and I uh, I love the idea of Yotaro eventually allowing him to pet Raiji Maru's belly. I can actually see the alternative angle because, like, the way he went with Yuma, he went with. Here is a neighbor who is more experienced than Yuma is, but he could have also gone the angle of, like, he fights Jin, because Jin is also kind of an older, more wily mentor figure. So e either one works, really. We have seen a lot of Yuma fights when he's a more experienced veteran, so I am pretty happy that Visa did fight with him, because it's made for more variety in Yuma fights, I, I suppose. He's definitely not, like, the kind of opponent Yuma's fought before. Uh, the only all-rounder who can snipe is Reiji. Uh, it's once again, we're uh, Tamakoma OP. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, composed beefcake, I mean. D did we just forget Arafune? Uh, is Arafune an all-rounder? Mate, mm, might be a retcon. I guess he's trying to be an all-rounder, but, but he hasn't tried being a gunner yet. So I guess I could understand that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I like the detail that gun triggers disincentivize switching out just by the sheer Trion consumption of, like, taking out another one is, like, the equivalent of taking out another gun. Yeah, I, I always wondered if, like, guns are directly tied to trigger holders, but um, apparently not, that they can be summoned and put away at will, only um, summoning consumes Trion. Yeah, I guess I guess introducing that handicap makes sense given um, 
he tore around Scruffy Hottie's explanation of the advantages of using the gun triggers to gang up on people. Yeah. In in this in this very volume. Uh, speaking of the triggers, moving on to the optional ones, I knew that lead bullets were heavy, but not that they weighed over a hundred kilograms. Jeez. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Ren Tsukimi, the Miwa Squad operator, is Tachikawa's childhood friend. Uh, she also taught him strategy and was herself taught by Azuma. So, so I, uh, I wonder how she came to be in uh, in Miwa Squad, uh, that mysterious lass. Since, since like she was probably one one of the earliest border operators. Hmm. I also do wonder where that reader inferred that they had a close relationship from yeah like oh with tachikawa i i, d- I don't know uh, wh- where they got that from from the manga i don't remember them interacting one one thing i liked with tachikawa in this is um adding more nuances to the faction with why tachikawa affiliates with kido uh tachikawa isn't under him because he agrees with his policies he just wants to go on the away missions more which kido emphasizes M- maybe he's not sargon of a cad after all then <laughs> Ashihara notes the importance of having Kyusei as the young one in the antagonist team to demonstrate the internal issues of the opposing side in a conflict. We also see mm. uh, that he kind of uses this technique in the Galapola battle as um, as well with Reggie, w- without getting too much into it. Nobody's going to imitate Satori. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. Um, hmm. Uh, uh, Ashihara is trying to defend Satori's stupid double sniping, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna give it the grace of being discussed on the podcast. It's it's bloody daft, and it, it always was. I like the okay. This is the world building nugget of the world thinks gates only open in Mikado City, even though there's other ones opening around the world. I'm like, okay, sure. This one city in Japan. The world is convinced it's the only place. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, ge- I guess it. I guess it works with the beacon, but uh, I don't know how. I don't know how how yeah. it works exactly with that. I'm. I'm. Gl- I'm just glad that like this series has never drawn attention to there being like any form of social media in this world. <laughs> so mm. it doesn't. That sort of question doesn't really weigh too heavily. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone actually asked who the main character of World yes. Figure is, and Ashihara said it's uh, all four of the uh, all four of the characters who appeared in the first color spread. So yeah, uh, good for him. It's very interesting because uh, I know Toei loves to use Yuma as the poster character. Uh, he was also on the cover for Volume One, but also Osamu had the title of of the first chapter. So. Um, yeah, it's um, it's always been a mixed bag, and we are, we've already like discussed uh, how like Ch- Chika influences the motivation uh, motivation of the characters a lot, uh, so she could be considered a main character as well. Mm. It was interesting that uh, the away missions are usually yeah. scavenging missions, only stopping at a conflicted country t- uh, briefly to steal the triggers. So uh, eyesight is perfected in try and body, so uh, you can still be a sniper if your vision is bad. The people with glasses still keep them because the glasses are tied to their identity, as Ashihara says. <laughs> oh, how, how did I not note this one down? <laughs> Truly the glasses paradise. Okay, I think with all that, shall we, shall we move on to spoiler corner? No, I think, yeah, let's. So there's a few things that we've already touched on. Uh, that I wanted to discuss here. Uh, so one of which is um, that comment on Ashihara, what he thinks the main characters are, that's interesting. Because Jin has been out of the focus of the story for so long with the rank wars, and Yuma has been more of a bit player playing into Osamu's strategies, I've, I've pretty much just thought of Osamu and Chika as the main characters for the longest time. You can definitely tell in my video essay um, I'll trigger a love letter to mm. underdogs. I, I very much frame it that way. Um, but maybe if the, <laughs> once this whole exam arc finishes, it might switch back to it being more of an even focus. Uh, yeah, true. So, it's interesting how Enidora the Explorer disobeyed orders from High Rain so as not to attack the base, uh, given that he knew someone would be left behind? Uh, so, since, like, uh, High Rain told him that that uh, that, uh, that they would leave uh, Husei behind, and uh, told Husei vice versa. 
So, uh, I, I know that he wasn't clever enough to expect a betrayal, but given that he knew Husei was going to be sacrificed, um, he kind of should have known better than to, like, disobey his commander. I mean, he's he is very egotistical enough <laughs> himself. <laughs> That's like his whole deal. He is cartoonishly so. Yeah, I, I, I guess they do say uh, that that like the black trigger, the black horns have taken hold of his brain. So, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it, it's no wonder that Tyrain abandoned Anadora, the explorer. He keeps calling Earthlings monkeys. Well, monkeys are not uh, are not birds. We only do bird metaphors on our planet, Anadora. <laughs> you, you cheeky himbo, you. <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah. Anadora is too evil to be a himbo. We um we touched on like the the decision of the fight matchups to have. Uh, Visa with Yuma and Hughes with Jin. Um, Hughes fighting with Jin here is quite handy in hindsight because it gives the two of them the chance to share some action when Hughes is going to have plenty of time to do that with Yuma and the others later because he when he joins the when he joins Tamakoma too. It's true. It it also begins the rivalry which we noticed recently. Um, uh, who um who don't we get along with? Uh, can I write in Jin? <laughs> Okay, so I forget. Did we ever see composed beefcake use full arms? Uh, um, I I I forget completely uh, what that power up was. I uh, Yotaro keep men uh, keeps mentioning it and barely remember Galapola, or as I like to call it, uh, Galapoland. <laughs> Galapoland. I don't know. I I assumed that was like him decking the things head on. That's what full arms was. Um, it also could be something that I've forgotten in Galapola. I wanted to touch on. So we talked about the anime announcement. Since season two is one core, my thinking is that it'll probably basically cover the Galapola stuff, and then maybe the last episode will lead into the match with Katori Squad and Kakizaki Squad. I think it might it might like feature both of those things, and then season three uh, would move on into into the matches with first with Ikoma Squad and OG Squad, and after that with Yuba Squad and the others, kind of putting an end to the rank wars. Like the the comicbook.com news mentioned that uh, the second season w will feature a returning cast uh, along with, alongside the new additions of uh, Hisaogawa as Gatlin, then uh, Ratarikov, uh, basically all the Galapola characters, and uh, as well as as well as the Katori Squad characters and Kakizagi. Right, yeah. So it might include that match, and that would also make it easier to fit uh, the remaining parts of the Rank War into however many calls they want to do. Um, I'm guessing two or three, but um, yeah, I, I, my hunch is that they will get to the end of the rank wars because one of the visuals for season two, uh, initially was, um, that it did have Yuba on it, who only appears in the final big match. So, um, ob obviously it won't be in season two, but I think they will. I think they are going to adapt to the end of the rank wars with these two seasons. Yeah, so, uh, so season three for that makes sense. It does mean us not getting the glory of Ikoma for a while. <laughs> we, 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 are, we, are too, we, are, we are not blessed yet. This arc also made me think if Hido ever attempts uh, like leaving Tamakoma in the future to, d to die on another planet like Hyrain did with Yusei. Hmm. Uh, we're still kind of in the mindset of thinking that uh, Afto is the end game, but m maybe it will be Kido's faction. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I could see that. Like maybe midway through the mission, Kido's faction pulls something. Hmm. It's it's at a stage where it's like, and it's a, it's a truce where I feel like it it could go either way. It could hold, or it could they could pull the rug out from under us, and it wouldn't be a huge leap either way. I don't think it would also make sense. Like we're building up so many characters from Border, so so many characters from Kido's factions, so. Something something like this, it, if it happened, I'm not saying that it's definitely going to happen, but if it happened, it, it would make sense for building building up opponents this way. Okay, that's all my spoiler comments. It's time for the Q&A segment. First of all, we got a question from Randall Jr. Thanks for recording the episode. Uh, I always enjoy you guys talk about World Trigger. I just thought of a question for next time. What would make for a good filler episode next season? I'm thinking a battle royale free for all with everyone on a giant map that is a replica of a city. Replica, you say? Uh, I think uh, it's the it's the Galapola crew. Uh, they they're in a at a diner and they're like trying to fig they're trying to figure out like how Earth things work on their way to Mikado City, and um, what's the name of the what's the name of the one who's like they leave behind? 
or the one who gets really annoyed at the end. They don't leave him behind. Uh, Reggie? I don't know. Reggie. And, and, and Reggie is just constantly getting into argu- arguments with the, like, the waiter who just has, like, a goofy, just, like, chipper, just like, Hey, welcome to our diner! What can I get you? Yay! <laughs> sort of attitude. I don't know. I think that would be an amusing setup. I keep wanting to call him Reggie. Reginald. Reggie, Reggie 8, Reg, Reggie Rock. I think a, a Battle Royale w- would be, uh, it's a decent episode, but but uh, I don't know how you would fit that into Gallipola plus Rank Wars. My reservation on putting, like, filler episodes that try and do serious fights is that I'm like, I'm not, I don't, I never trust anime-only staff of an adaptation to do, or, well, not anime, but, you know, like, anime-only writers in an adaptation to handle the combat system well i guess that makes sense i um i thought that maybe uh you could do a short mm. rank war either like solo rank wars uh, or maybe one of the matches b- between the teams that uh, like we've met but uh we don't see in the manga yeah. also i i would really like a day in the life of the operators or the engineers uh, just to put some more emphasis on them yeah i, th- I think we brought this up yeah, that would be a really interesting perspective. Like a, or maybe a battle between operators, each uh, operating uh, their own specialised rabbit or a mar mod. Uh, this could be quite fun, especially with Usami. So, on Reddit, it's user Nameless Extra 4 uh, who asks, Opinion on a Scudo in combat. Given this volume is where a Scudo had its best showing. And I'm like, okay, so... I think I've gone over that it's one of my favourite triggers. Um, I think this volume was its flashiest showing, but it's not my personal favourite. Uh, I find the ways it's used in the Rank Wars a lot more interesting, uh, where it's like, a lot of a lot of it is about, like, positioning and, like, um, <laughs> there's the one where it, it just pops out of Murakami's back. I found the ways a bit more inventive there, and that's what, that's what I really like out of Escudo, is, is when it's using creative ways. Trapping Hughes kind of seemed very easy, I suppose. Uh, which is why I, I wasn't I wasn't like a huge fan of it. Like uh, when it comes to terraforming triggers, I'm I'm really more of a fan of Spider Scruffy Hotter using it uh, during their escape. He basically just used it to block the paths, and um, yeah. and there we go. That's that's all we ever saw of it. So yeah, it, it wasn't really that much of a feature. Uh, when they do have to fight inside the building, that's I suppose where it's best used. I can see why I completely forgot about. Granted, I completely forget about a lot of things as we gone over <laughs> this series, but I can see why I completely forgot about it between here and the rank wars on my last visit, read through slash watch through. Okay, uh, we do have some spoiler questions for uh, from Nameless Extra. Do we want to leave it until the, until the end? Our Q and A section's already basically in the spoiler corner anyway. <laughs> All right then. So initial thoughts on Urashima and Rokita. Yeah, Urashima is basically the cheap Mexican scruffy hotty. Uh, I like to call him Huffy Scroty. Uh, we don't know that much of, about him or his character. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that that he's like the only member of his squad uh, apart from uh, apart from his operator, but uh, eh, not not much apart from that. Meanwhile, mm. Rokita seems like a pretty fun nervous disaster. I'm looking forward to her having any speaking lines, maybe. This uh, this user goes on to ask predictions of the fourth member of each team, and uh, the thing is, these sorts of chapters, like the one we got um, at the start of this month, are the ones I'm a little worried about recapping, because I do not have much to say. It was like, I'm sure it'll be fine in the grand scheme of things, but it was just a lot of names, most of which I didn't remember being listed off, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> I didn't have really any predictions on, like, the, the fourth member of each team, given that we don't really know the order of uh, how um, how the captains are going to be picking next, but I did have an order of which agents might be picked first. But that's also depending on, like, uh, which agents that they already have. So, first, who I think would be is Kitora, then probably Yuba, then probably Terrier, then Husei, then Tomoe, and then Katori. Uh, I, I don't have any predictions on the other ones because I don't remember them. I do actually have an answer to uh, this user's next question, uh, which is the team that you're most excited for in the selection exam, uh, which is Kakizaki, because... I'm really interested to see how he progresses as a captain, because his match with Katori squad and Tamakoma squad set up a really nice character arc for him with that. 
So. Um, meanwhile, I think my favorite uh, team will be OG Squad. Uh, it has all the funniest characters. It, it has OG, who is mildly funny. Uh, it has Ikoma, who is a riot. Uh, it has uh, Tsuji, who also has some uh, has a fun trait, and it has Nire, Kagura's operator, who also had like a fun dynamic with Emma. And I'm really looking forward to seeing them interact. And I hope they get another. Either another fun character or just the just the Tsukami of the straight man. I I don't like the ambiguity of this trope name, but uh, yeah, the the Tsukami of this uh, of this group, so they can react to the other's wackiness. The foil. Yeah, I, I suppose the foil. Also, I think uh, it would be interesting if, if Wakamura took Yusei, given that we had so much like internal monologue from him. Mm. So, uh, Arcus Rhapsody uh, has a few questions from the WMR uh, Discord server. A strange question, uh, if you could be one type of animal, uh, what would you be and why? And also, if Osama was an animal, what kind of animal would he be and why? Uh, so, so, first of all, Osama would be a spider, definitely. I, I don't think we could choose anything else, really. Uh, spider is a great, is a great shout. Uh, what kind of animal would you be? It took me a bit to choose, because, like, hippos are OP. Uh, hip hippos are really overpowered, uh, but dogs, when in good circumstances, are really happy and carefree. But when there's something wrong with a dog, they don't know, they can't rationalise any way for things to be better, so it's really scary to be them. Uh, and then I just realised whales are really cool, I've always liked whales. I like how they evolved from, like, fish to moose things back to fish-looking things, so I, I some kind of whale. Yeah, All right then, and then uh, then I I think I would be a toucan because of my big hooked nose. So so yeah, next mm -hmm. time you have a big color spread with four main characters among animals, I uh, um I do hope we see some toucans and some and some whales, Ashihara. Another question from Arcus Rhapsody. I have another weird question. If you had to pick one of these four dere types to be your partner, which would you pick? and has a diagram of the Sundere, Yandere, Kudere, and Dandere archetypes. Okay, so I default to Dandere typically, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't get into the occasional Yandere when they're handled right. Um, uh, the... I guess it would probably be uh, Dandere for me as well. I'm not really that fussed about like what archetype my partner would be uh, if they liked me generally and if if they were nice to me i think yeah i think one thing i've realized over time is like i was i had a very sense of like oh yeah these kinds of characters are what i find attractive and over time i've just come to come to realize like i can find a lot of different traits attractive i can find a lot of different kinds of people attractive so yeah i don't really want to limit it to just like oh yeah i just like this type anymore as much yeah, that would probably be my answer. And also, th there's the question of if Osama could choose uh, one of uh, these Dere types, uh, which one would uh, he pick? And the answer is all of them, because obviously he's uh, he's a harem protagonist. I'm, I mean, that's obvious. I, I feel like an aloof, battle-ready Kudere type who can sort of gently tease him and then like also train him up and get him, uh, you know, good and ready for the away mission and for protecting his friends. So Kitora. Ah. She's kind of a Hime Dare, though. Or a Sundare, maybe. Yeah, an A rank Dare. <laughs> <laughs> an A rank Dare. And I guess Undare and Dare Dare would work for him as well. Because uh, uh, they, they posted an like even more extensive list of other Dare archetypes. He's shipped basically with either a Tsundere or a Kudare, which is Kitora, a Dandere, that's Chika. Then also, uh, I suppose Konami would be an Undare? Or Shiori would be an Undare? Yeah. A Jindere. <laughs> also, I think, uh, would Yuma count as a Kudere? Uh, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I probably would call him a Kudere. So, yeah. This is from Eerie Grey. Which stupid hat sniper has the stupidest hat? Akane has... Hers looks like the hot gold soul silver girl protagonists. Uh, so that one sticks out to me a bit, I guess. I find it kind of charmingly silly, though. Mm, the stupidest hat would probably be Oki with his girl hat. I... I'm not really particularly a, f a fan of his, but uh, also Arafune, if his uh, if his full cap is a MAGA hat. Another one from Arcus Rhapsody. Is there any imagery or aesthetic that instantly freaks you out? Hmm. I think for me, it's anything that like clearly depicts some sort of pain. It's an easy one. As far as manga examples go, 
One that really got me was a certain portion of a Junji Ito manga where people started slowly transforming into slugs. <laughs> that really freaked me out. Uh, so people transforming into slugs, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I, I think a good example is is in the actual question. Eries and Karobos was the fingernails being ripped off. Yeah, that one's pretty nasty. I never liked that. I, I can easily like associate the pain and then hyperbolize it. So mm. uh, in my mind, so yeah, not not great. Mm. It's something you can understand as well, which is yeah, it makes it more real. Whereas like you know, you see someone get get decapitated, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Especially if it has, like, an unrealistic blood spurt or whatever. All right, then. Shall we round off? Let's. So, that is going to do it for the eighth episode of Dogface Diaries. You can listen to us on so many podcast hosting sites, uh, anchor.fm slash Cheddar and youtube.com slash c slash Cheddar is the primary pair where all the links are, but you can also listen to us on so many podcast hosting sites uh, like Spotify, iTunes, Bean, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Radio Public, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Play FM, Podbay Castro, and Listen Notes. Remember that much like the neighbourhood, the YouTube algorithm is a dark abyss of sorrows and woes from which channels like these never resurface. And what helps us navigate it is liking, subscribing and sharing the podcast with a friend. On uh, youtube.com slash c slash Cheddar is where you also get not only access to Duckface Iris, but Manga Mosaic, a collection of podcasts and video essays on other manga titles, short and long alike. Uh, so recently, and it's also available on our RSS feed, uh, we put out a Chainsaw Man podcast with Hoven and Jacob Parker Dalton of OtaQuest to, to celebrate its jump run finale. So uh, yeah, do come check it out. Uh, next month, if I can manage it, it will be a look back on the 2020 jump starts in a top 10 and a bottom 9 list. Why bottom 9? Because there's only 19 jump starts, I think, this year. Because I like to go one step beneath. <laughs> <laughs> Kill me. Uh, all right then. Uh, so, uh, plug our sister show. Uh, Hoven Sideaway, where you talk about miscellaneous stuff, uh, usually manga. And I have a We Never Learn ending discussion in the works. Depending on when I get around to editing it, uh, I am not rushing this one because, uh, yeah, I had to do the Chainsaw Man one in like two days, so I'm gonna take it easy with this one. Thank you for stepping in to edit it at such a short notice. It uh, was really appreciated. No problem. If you'd like to help me upload these on a regular basis, consider supporting me on patreon.com slash Cheddar. In return for your support, you get access to rewards such as add the $1 tier, a shout out under your name in the credits, add the $3 tier, requesting a short series to be covered on the Manga Mosaic podcast, add the $6 tier, a World Trigger Dark Face avatar, add the $12 tier, access to the show notes, and add the $25 tier, requesting a series to be covered on a long form video essay. High level contributors get access to manga threads for series from the Shonen Jump Vault I'm reading for, uh, for the very first time, including my first impressions on the chapters and standout panels. At the time of this podcast release, I'll have posted five new reviews of the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga to cover the missing tier two months. So that's $3 a month if you want to access the madness that is season zero materials worth of Yu-Gi-Oh! It's quite a lot of people calling each other gamers, which is... Become a patron to show that you are a gamer. <laughs> Uh, help me reach goals such as reviving World Trigger Bridge or more manga video essays. Now, patrons can vote on the subject of the video essay every time we hit a milestone. I've been asked a while ago if I'd check out Jujutsu Kaisen, which uh, suddenly became one of the most long-running uh, series in Jump when I wasn't looking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been saving it for an occasion like that, so um, if you'd like me to do that, go there and support. Send us emails, questions, comments, suggestions at wednesdaydale 12 at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at Duckface Diaries, individual Twitters at Wensley Cheddar and at Hoven with an H. A sincere thank you to Milo Jack Sillitz who composed our new ending theme, an orchestral rendition of Girigiri, the first opening sequence for World Trigger. You can find his work at soundcloud.com slash Milo Jack Sillitz. And next time we'll be covering volume 9, which covers chapters 71 to 79, and anime episodes 32 to a bit of 35. Sorry viewers, you're back to this nigger and roll again where the last episode of the match <laughs> Uh, goes into material that we won't be covering, so do as you will. 
All right then, thank you very much for listening, and this was the ninth episode of Duckface Diaries, and as always, it's time to bugger off. Thank you.